All right, guys. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023. Uh, this is episode 164 of the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast. And today, we have a guest episode. Yep. I was looking at your fists, was clint- clinched, really. <laughs> Both of your fists, I can't even speak. Both of your fists are clenched. Uh, first off, I hope the, everyone, happy new year, guys. Happy new year. <laughs> oh, this is a terrible start. Terrible stuff. We're keeping it all in now. <laughs> this is the start of 2023 we didn't want. Yeah. Um, we are releasing today an episode that I filmed over in Florida, in Jupiter, with Claude Harmon. Yes. The third. Now, Claude has an incredible pedigree in the world of golf. His dad, well, first off, himself, he coaches some of the biggest names in world golf. Mm-hmm. DJ. Is, is one of his biggest clients, Dustin Johnson. Brooks Kepka started working with him again. Big names. And many other players. His dad is Butch Hardman. Legend. Who famously coached Tiger when he first hit the scene back in the early, before 2000s. Yeah. And worked with Tiger for a decent length of time. Yeah. Butch has also started working with Ricky Fowler again over a bit of absence they've had. And Claude's granddad won the Masters in, I believe, 1971. Golfing family? Crazy. Now, they're based currently at the Floridian Golf Club uh, over in Jupiter, which I've got a break 75 from there coming out very soon. But the day after I filmed that, we sat down with Claude on the balcony of the clubhouse, which is absolutely spectacular. It's looking over the harbour. It's beautiful. And we dive into the world of, of Claude Harmon because his, his story, his background, his life, his passions. He's very passionate about golf coaching mm. and improving. Um, interestingly, in this podcast, now, and we've spoken about this a few times, how he doesn't believe that um, his own ability as a golf coach he basically says he's not very good at golf. At golf, so he, he kind of says that. I'm what, what do you mean by not great? very? Well, yeah, so he, he reckons he plays off about ten, eleven handicap. Oh wow, left-handed. He says I can. I know what I need to do to my students, but I'm not particularly great yeah, at doing that, it myself. That makes sense. And that goes to back to a lot of things that I've picked up on in the past. Like obviously, I know how to improve golf for swing and how to make them better. Sometimes I'll see if I've had a bad break 75, like, I'm not listening to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But it's to- totally different. Well, that's the thing. I think it does, even though as I completely agree with that, you don't need to be an amazing golfer to be a great golf coach. It does also sound a bit odd when you go, you're go off 11. You think, God, I thought it'd be a, a scratch handicapper. But it doesn't matter. And like you said, if that was the case, if, if your coach had to be better than you, then who would coach the tour pros? Who's exactly. going to coach Tiger Woods in his prime? Because no one's better than him. So it's more about your knowledge and also one of the big things when you get to that elite level, I guess, as well, any level, but certainly that elite level where these guys are playing for millions of dollars, it's how they communicate and how the relationship they have with the coach as well. It's all about communication because also uh, Claude was telling the stories, which we'll listen to in a moment, how he used to sit in in the coaching sessions when Butch, his dad, was coaching Tiger. Oh, wow. Like when he was a young kid. Like how mad's that? After this podcast as well, and we're going to release it as a special podcast-only exclusive video. So if you've not um, subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast channel, do so. Hopefully by this point, we're over 200,000 subscribers. Hopefully. There's going to be a video out where Claude Harmon gives me a lesson. Nice. Straight after this podcast. So it might be released in the next couple of days, but stay tuned for that. And that's going to be obviously video only. It's not going to make for a great audio podcast. <laughs> um, so without further ado, um, let's dive into this fantastic episode with Claude Harmon III, filmed at the Floridian. Enjoy. Well, Claude, thank you. For this wonderful opportunity to sit down with you here, and, and I'm I'm not saying that because I'm here right now. The Floridian, I think it might be my favourite place on earth. Yeah, it's 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 a really, it's a special place. You know, I'm incredibly lucky to 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 get to come here and work here every day, and um, yeah, it's it's a really really great spot. The golf course is good, the location, the weather, and uh, yeah, we're lucky. If you're listening to this, make sure you check out the YouTube video because where we are right now, we're at the back of the clubhouse overlooking this harbour. Uh, I got a chance to play the golf course yesterday, and again, thank you for sorting that out. Unbelievable. The golf course is unbelievable. Yeah, I, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun golf course. Listen, there are, there are a lot more difficult golf courses in this part of the world, you know, kind of Jupiter, South Florida, 
you know, you've got Seminole, you've got Medalist, which is tough that you've played. You've yeah. got the Bears Club, which is really, really tough. Um, I think it, at, here at Floridian, we've got a nice mix of holes. It's always in, in, in really good shape. And, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to keep the greens in fantastic conditions. And, and that's why, you know, the guys that, that play on tour, um, you know, they love that Ricky, you know, Ricky Fowler's played here. My dad's in town um, for the pro member and he played yesterday and had a chance to birdie the last hole to shoot 60 and made bogey and shot 62 and then <laughs> went out again today and shot 62 again so a little 62 60 62 from slick rick so he's a favorite for this weekend's tournament <laughs> i think so and then you have a few other tour players down here practicing right yeah i mean dj's a member here brooks is a member here um ken duke who used to play the the pj tour now plays the senior tour uh, or the champions tour as they call it um he's here gary woodland's a member here so it's nice it's um you know, this is kind of ground zero for tour players. Um, you know, we've probably got 40 guys within, you know, 10 miles of where we are right now that play That's the tour. Yeah. So it's great and, you know, it's fun. And, um, you know, when the guys are home, the guys play a lot together. I mean, yeah. And that's always fun when, when the guys are home. They'll go out and they'll play. I think the guys, um, they play more than they practice when they're home. Yeah. And I think that's something that, that everybody listening could, could, you know, benefit from. They play more than they practice. And I think so many golfers are practicing way more than they're playing. Yeah. And it's almost like they're studying for a test that they never, they never get a chance to take. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, th I think you're right. I think you see a lot. No, we see it certainly in the UK because we don't have these sort of setups. You see a lot more driving range golfers who'll go to the driving range and beat balls off a mat. And it, and it's a way of practicing it is, you know, and it, sometimes it's the only way that people can practice. But there isn't anything better than being out on the golf course, putting yourself in some situations, even if you're throwing a couple of practice balls down and learning how to score and how to get round. I think it's something that I certainly kind of... I've been trying to work and I've seen more benefit of that over the last couple of years when I've played a little bit more because you can't playing golf isn't on the driving range is it well I said um you know on my podcast this week what I do now with players that come in you know let's say a player is going to come in and spend the full day with me that I've never met before regardless of their handicap level what I started doing a couple of years ago and, it, and I think it has been hugely beneficial for me as an instructor is we start the lesson by going out on the golf course first yeah so we kind of have a a five hole loop that's right around our, 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 our academy building so the third we play three through eight yeah. and we're going to get in that we're going to get a par five, a drivable par four, two par threes, and then some par fours. And so it's been really helpful for me to, to go out on the golf course and watch a player actually play golf as opposed to starting on the driving range. Because once I go out and I watch what the player does on the golf course, that's going to give me a pretty good idea of what I'm going to see on, on the driving range. But I think a lot of golfers are so driving range centric that – and I, yes, not everybody has the luxury to get out and play all the time. But if you do have the availability to play golf and you are serious about your golf, if you can find that balance to where you're playing as much as you're practicing, and then in an ideal world, you would be playing more than you're practicing. But I think in 2022, it's the opposite. I think yeah. most people um, spend the majority of their time on the driving range. Yeah, they do. And, you know, the guys that I work with professionally – when we're hitting balls and we're practicing, we're practicing and hitting balls for something specific. Mm -hmm. We're not just hitting balls to get at exercise. We're not just hitting balls for the sake of it. So if they're hitting it really, really good, you have DJ's home and we're working on something, we're hitting it really good, he's going to go, yo, let's get out on the golf course and see what it looks like. They want to get out and see what it's like on the golf course. And I think a lot of golfers are the opposite. If they play badly, they just want to get back to the range. The range is their comfort level. Yeah. It's their safe place where the best players in the world, they just want to play. They yeah. don't want to be on the driving range. They want to play golf. Well, they want to be able to test themselves. Um, I, I just thought when you were saying all that, then obviously you, you do teach Dustin Johnson, you've just mentioned that. Maybe a private jet might be going across the, or a helicopter in a minute. Um, obviously, you teach Dustin Johnson. You started working again back with Brooks Koepka. Um, 
all the tall pros that you play you, you uh, coach? Pat Perez and then I work with two girls on the LPJ tour, Marina Alex and Padre um and Nana Ricaran. I mean she's got nine nine or ten ends in her last name. So <laughs> And you've also obviously worked with Ernie Els when you won yeah, the Open. I worked with Ernie when at Royal for five years and um, Ricky Fowler. Did some work with Ricky, you've done some work with Jimmy Walker, you know, kind of the first player I really started working with um, professionally was Trevor Immelman. Trevor right. to this day is one of my, you know, dear friends and you know, Trevor and I both kind of started our professional careers around the same time. Yeah. I was lucky enough this um, summer at the open championship to um, have dinner um, with Adam Scott and Trevor. And, you know, I've known Adam and Trevor for, you know, going on 20 something years. We all kind of started on the European tour yeah. at the same time. You know, Adam was a rookie on the European tour. Trevor was, you know, just starting out. So that kind of knowing those guys for so long, when we do get together, sometimes you're like, man, we're, you know, I'm 53, they're in their forties. You know, we've all got kids. I mean, but when we think back, to you know flying around in, on the european tour back when it really was the european tour yeah you'd go to uh, dubai and qatar but other than that it was the old school european yeah. tour you know french open portuguese open you know these four or five week stints in europe which you know i i miss that so much it was so much fun back then i bet you had a blast forest of arden oh I mean, yeah yeah no, trevor, right. i remember we were going out it's one of my favorite stories so trevor Immelman's old caddy a guy named neil wallace um, who he was on his bag when he won the Masters. Um, Trevor was last off in the Pro-Am on a Wednesday at the Forest of Arden. It's about 45, 50 degrees. It just looks like it's just going to absolutely just start chucking it down with rain, and we're last off. <laughs> and so <laughs> Trevor's got one umbrella, and he's in a terrible mood as per usual because, you know, he's just such a perfectionist and it's just really started to rain. And Neil and I are kind of underneath the umbrella and Trevor hits this iron shot and we hand him the umbrella. So now we're, you know, typical tour player walks off with the umbrella. We're standing there and he <laughs> takes the divot and it's been raining for, you know, 10, 15 minutes now. And he just takes the divot and throws it straight back and it hits Neil Wallace right in the center of the chest, mud and everything. And just quietly just to himself to nobody just said neil just said man i knew i should have studied harder and stayed in school <laughs> so i wouldn't have to do this but that was the old school european tour days where you know there were a bunch of tournaments in scotland there were a bunch of tournaments in ireland yeah. there were a bunch of tournaments in the uk and then all the stuff you know in continental europe canary islands and yeah, all of those tournaments so um it, what, what what i was going to get to there obviously you mentioned the, the list of names that many of our listeners and viewers will know of some obviously a huge amount of major winners we had a little tour around your performance center here and between your dad and, and yourself and the, the coaches you you've you've made some champions right you've had how many, yeah, how many majors listen, between we, you we've been i mean i've been a part of seven major championships and i've got to think my dad is Got to be close to 20. Well, he has. You know, obviously, I mean, obviously with, his time with you know, Tiger. Tiger and then, you know, all the different players, you know, the bunch that he won with Phil. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's something that that it's – I think it's a part of, of our family's history. I mean, obviously having a, a grandfather that won a major championship, the Masters, you know, in the late 40s. And then to to – you know, the fact that my grandfather won the Masters and then I I was – at Augusta and when Tiger won his first Masters. And then, you know, I never thought that I'd follow in the footsteps of my dad. And then to remember 2004, Trevor Immelman, he qualified for the Masters. And it was the first time I'd been there as a coach. And to yeah. walk, you know, onto the driving range at Augusta, you know, with, you know, the family name that I've got, you know, it, it is just such a cool thing. And then DJ winning, you know, in the COVID years and um, yeah, you know, competitive golf, I think is, is been a part of, you know, certainly my family, you know, my dad and, and myself, my grandfather, but all my uncles, I mean, competitive golf has been part of our family's DNA. No, of course. I mean, like saying in the performance studio where you've got the reception area, your mission was to fill the wall with all these champions and you've pretty much achieved that yeah, to the point where what, yeah, you're, we, now needing to put, you're now needing to put pictures <laughs> down in the hallway later, you know, further down now yeah. with even more wins that have come this year. But what, what I wanted to get on, I really do want to dive into the kind of history of what really, <clears throat> obviously your dad coached and everything else, but why you got into coaching in a minute. Let's say a regular golfer, 
50k, 15 handicapper, and they've plucked up the courage to book a lesson with you. And I say courage because there's got to be some level of worry and anxiety. How do, how do you put them at ease? Because surely you're going out for the first time and you stand in there with the history you have and the pedigree you come from. How does a 15 handicapper not be stood over that shot, shaking like crazy because they're in your kind of presence, you know? Yeah, listen, I mean, we're not curing cancer here. I mean, I'm, I'm a golf instructor. My job is to help people, you know, play a sport with a ball and a stick, right? So it's not rocket science. It's not, you know, as complicated as I think people think it is. And my dad has always said that golf is a pretty simple game that tends to baffle and confuse smart people. Um, and it's when you think point, about it, it, it is really, it's a game with a ball and a stick. And the object of the game of it is to get the ball in the hole in the least amount of strokes. And I think sometimes people forget that it is a game. Yeah. It is a, it, it, that's why they have a scorecard. It's, there's an object to try and see how quickly you can change. I think my job as an instructor, Rick, has always been, I think I've been successful because I never played golf at any competitive level. I was, I was actually going to come on to that because I didn't know the, the background around I, that. I never played golf. Golf wasn't cool when I was growing up like it is now. You know, golf, when I was growing up, my dad was a, 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 worked at a country club and wore sands about slacks. And, you know, there were no cool people playing golf. There was no people like Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy. I mean, Greg Norman was like the rock star of, of my generation, right? He was cool. But everybody, you know, Larry Mize wasn't cool, right? Ian Woosnam wasn't cool. Oh, they come were, on. They no, were that, I draw the line there. <laughs> they were unbelievable golfers. So growing up, golf was, you know, still very much a, a rich white person sport. So yeah. it was a country club sport. I, so I, I didn't play a lot of golf growing up. My dad didn't put any pressure on me to play golf. I think that mainly came from the fact that his father won the Masters and he was a good player and tried to play the tour. And I think because he felt so much of that pressure on him. So I think I tried out for my high school golf team in the ninth grade and it was a nine hole um, qualifier. And I, I guarantee I didn't break 50. Really? And I just didn't play. But I always liked being around my dad when he was giving lessons. And in the summertime, I would watch my dad teach and my grandfather was still alive. And they did a, my dad and all of his brothers who were all, you know, instructors and club pros, they used to do a, a, a summer golf school. And so when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, my dad said, hey, you know, do you want to come up and, you know, hang out and work? So my job was to set the range up. And my dad was one of the real early adopters to video. Yeah. I ran the video camera. So to be honest with you, unlike a lot of instructors, my background for being a golf instructor is I just watched my dad, my uncles, my yeah. grandfather teach. So I just basically watched them give golf lessons. And, and were you interested at that point, though? Obviously I wasn't you... interested in golf, per se, but I was always interested in, you know, I liked the, the problem-solving aspect of it. I liked the fact that, you know, and in watching my dad, my dad has always tried to make things incredibly simple. So when I used to watch him give golf lessons, I was always you know, surprised at how basic and simple it was for someone of his stature. Yeah. Um, and then I just, I had such a ringside seat because around the time I started helping my, you know, my dad and my uncles um, in golf lessons, that was right around the time my dad started teaching tour players. Yeah. You know, the first player my dad worked with was Steve Elkington. And then he started working with Davis Love and then went on to Greg Norman. My uncles in, at that time in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, my uncle Dickie who passed away, um, he was working with Curtis Strange and Lanny Watkins and Bren wow. Crenshaw. My uncle Craig um, was the head pro at Oak Hill Country Club where they've had, you know, a million majors yep. and Ryder Cups. Yep. And he was Jeff Sluman's only coach, started coaching him as a junior and then Jeff went on and won the PJ. And my uncle Billy, my dad's youngest brother, um, caddied for Jay Haas for over 20 years. Bill Haas is named after. I mean, you are. Like, so I was always around professional golf, too. Well, it's in your family. I mean, So I think when you're around and you're on tour, I was on tour and have been on tour the majority of my life. Yeah. You know, my mom said that, you know, two weeks after I was born, I was, 
in the back of a station wagon while my dad was playing the PGA Tour. But I was always at tour events, always yeah. on the range. You know, people like Freddie Couples, you know, I'm 53. Freddie's in his mid-60s. I've known Freddie Couples pretty much the majority of my life, right? I mean, I've known Freddie since I was in middle school and high school. So all of these players, I just was always around them. Yeah. And, you know, we would go to the, ma the Masters every year. And I remember going to the Masters when my grandfather was still alive and him taking me to the champion's locker room and having breakfast and, you know, Sam Snead and, you know, Arnold Palmer and Gary Player and Byron Nelson and wow. Seve and all of these people were around. So I've just always been around that environment. I honestly don't think I could have had the career, Rick, that I've had having no background in playing golf if I wasn't around the tour as much as I was. Of course. Because I think I was around the tour so much, I was able to kind of know what the tour was like, what what it was, what to expect. And, and, and I know, suppose in that, you knew what players wanted out of it. Well, you, my dad always said, listen, if you're going to work with tour players, you can't guess. Great. You have to be right. That's really Because this is their livelihood, of course it is. right? So this is what they do for a living. So if a tour player or a player that is playing competitively comes to you, and that's their, their, the way they make a living. He's like, you can't be wrong. Yeah. You have to make the right calls. And yeah. And how, how do you do that all the time? Do you, do, you some, do you sometimes rather than guess say, I'll get back to you on something or? Listen, I mean, you get it wrong, right? You know, I've, I've worked with players to where, you know, I've, I've prided myself on working with players and, and helping players. But I have definitely worked with players that didn't get any better when I worked with them. I worked with, you know, for about six months this year with Garrett Kigo, and I wish I'd had l longer. I think I probably could have helped him a l more than I did, but he didn't really get any better in the six months that I worked with him. And that pisses me off. Yep. I mean, it makes me mad that, yeah, I wish I would have had more time, but then I look at the time that I had and I was like, I should have, done a better job that because that's that was my job yeah there's always but someone like that what would what would you have done differently i don't know but i should have helped him more than i did <laughs> because he didn't see the benefits of what we were doing i felt like we were really on the right path i get yeah um he told me what he wanted to work on he was a big you know garrick is you know he put he plays left-handed he's a big hooker he said he wanted to fade the golf ball and get a little bit more to a controllable shape but his natural shape was a draw but as the player he came to me and said listen i want to fade the golf ball yeah so we worked on fading the golf ball and that was something that was tough for him to do inevitably he eventually said listen i just want to go back to drawing it i wish that like i said i wish that i had had more time to yeah. to, to spend with him but yeah you you get it wrong sometimes you 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 make bad calls, but I'm lucky in that I feel like I've, in my career, I've made more good calls than I have bad calls. Um, I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting. I, I'd love to pick your brains on this. I think, I think I know the answer, but it, was it, did you ever find it challenging almost a little bit being in the shadow of your, of your dad and his name? Listen, there are still people in 2022, I'm 53 years old and I've been coaching pretty much nonstop on all the various tours around the world since around 2000, 2001. So I've been doing this for the better part of two decades. And there are still people that don't think I know anything, think that all the players I work with, I just get handed them to them by my dad. And I'm, I'm just lucky. And, and how, how do you feel about that? At this point, do it's you, almost... Do you, do you walk into your office that you showed me earlier with all no, the pictures at, at and all the point, trophies? Listen, at this point, it's almost, you know, for me, it's comical. You know, there are a couple of reporters that, you know, harp on about that, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm like, mate, if, you know, it's always the Hank Haney quote, right? You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts, right? So, listen, I, I, had, a, I had a ringside seat for the 10 years that Tiger and my dad were together. Yeah. And... I saw Tiger in 1993, the first golf lesson he ever took from my dad. I videoed that golf lesson. Oh I watched I yeah. watched 10 years of those two together, Yeah, right? I fundamentally believe 
that the work that my dad did with Tiger is the best that Tiger has ever swung the club. And I believe it's also probably the best that anybody has swung the club. But Tiger then fired my dad and went to work with Hank Haney and played unbelievable golf, right? You can't, now I have an opinion. I think the golf swing that my dad and Tiger were working on was, I like it better than the one that Hank and Tiger work on. But you can't look at what Hank and Tiger did and say it was better or worse than what my dad did. So, you know, you can always look at people, but when you look at players, I think that I've helped more players than I've hurt. And, you know, it took me, I, listen, imposter syndrome is real. Yeah. Right. And I had that for a long time. I, I, I get it. I felt like I was an imposter because, you know, I did work with a lot of the same players that my dad worked with. Um, did I get those players on my own? No. Did he say, hey, will you help me with this player? Yes. But anybody thinks that a 20-year career that I've had is based off of players playing for a living, having my father say, go work with my son and I'm at what I do and they're going to continue to do it out of some blind loyalty to my father. It's not going to happen. Just not going to happen. As you um, mentioned before, these these guys are playing for the livelihood. They're not going to just if they don't like what you're saying, it's not it's not going to work. Yeah, so listen, I, I I I was very lucky in that I had a tremendous amount of doors opened mm. to me. You know, when your last name is Harmon and you choose to go into the same golf instruction business as you know Butch Harmon being your father and all of that, you're sitting. You're on third base. Right. You, you're being you're basically being put on third base. And I always realized I never hit a triple to get there. I was basically from a golf instruction standpoint, I was born on third base. Yeah. Right. And my dad always has told me, don't <laughs> it up. Right. <laughs> because you can do that. Yeah. Right. You can. My dad has always said to me, you can fuck up talent. You can take a great player and mess it up. So. He would always say to me, you have to, when I was starting out as a young instructor, he would pull me into his office and just rip the out of me and beat me up and say, I was, I watched you teach today and that was horrendous. And you need to see things better. You need to see things faster. The player you worked with today struggled for too long. And he would go and it was watching you what try and impress this student with all these fancy words and stuff like that. And he said, if you can't fix the problem and if you can't fix the problem fast and see things and figure out what you need to do, he said, you need to find a new job. And that wow. is something that sticks with me every single day of my life when I teach. And it's something that I say to the players I work with and the, the coaches that I'm lucky enough to work with, see things faster. So, I think I just, I got lucky in that, you know, my dad is so good at what he does. And I used to just sit and we, in his studio in Vegas, in the early 2000s, you know, we've got a studio, we got four cameras, we've got one face on, one down the line, one from behind the student and one from above. And, you know, with the systems, you can run all of them. So what I would do, and so my dad would always kind of be, watching Tiger hit balls or whatever the student, he'd be kind of standing, you know, either down the line or looking straight at him. And I'd turn the back camera on. And then after we finished the day, I'd go back in and watch the lessons. And I'd look at what my dad was, where his eyes were going. So I would watch him ah. give a lesson. So he'd be standing, you know, face on, yeah. you know, you know, basically straight across from Tiger. And you'd watching be looking him. at the back camera. And, so, and I'm looking at the back camera. So what I would do is I would film kind of what his eyes were doing. Because, you know, when you're looking at a golf swing, you're looking at. Of course you are. And so I would try and figure out what the hell he was looking at. And would he ever be able to explain that to you? I never asked it. him. And he always had one extra look that I could never figure it out. But I would go in and I, <laughs> I would just spend hours watching what his eyes were looking at. Whether there was a pattern, whether there was... Yeah, and, and I kind of... I mean, he his eyes would scan the setup like, like a computer. And he could do it really, really fast. Yeah. I remember going out to the, the Titleist Performance Institute, Greg Rose and Dave Phillips, um, you know, who have 
you know, just been giants, you know, in my career, but, you know, they would put everybody on 3D. They used, you know, the AMM 3D system. And they would say that everybody that worked with your dad, you know, my dad is probably as non technology as you can get. He's old school, right? His computer is is in his eyes. Yeah. He's like, listen, I don't need a launch monitor to tell me what the player is doing. I don't need a 3D to tell me. I don't need a body track. I, you know, he's been doing this for 50, 60 years. He, he's, a, he's a personal but launch the guys monitor. at TPI would say that when my dad's players would come in and they'd get them on 3D and they would ask what they were working on or what my dad was trying to get them, they would say, Dude, your dad just isn't wrong. He's just, he's always trying to fix the problem. And the stuff he's trying to have the players work on, it's, it's the right stuff. Yeah. And we would look at it, the TPIs go, the looks, we'd look at it in 3D and they'd go, the reason why Butch is trying to get him to do this is because he doesn't. So I've always tried to, to emulate his ability to just say, listen, What's the problem? Yeah. How are we going to fix the problem as quickly as we possibly can? And we need to fix it now. And ever since, you know, I, my dad would have those conversations with me and he was tough on me and it would beat me up. I, I decided I was just going to play a game with myself that everybody that comes in that I'm going to work with, I play this game and it's the five ball game. Okay. And in my head, I, I say to myself, okay, I watch the player hit shots. I kind of, you know, I do the diagnostic. Okay, yep. tell me a little bit about your game. What type of shape do you want? Once I, once I hear the player tell me what they're working on, what they're trying to do, and then once I film them, screen them, get them on a launch monitor, whatever technology I'm going to use, I say to myself, okay, I've got all this data now. And I say, all right, in five swings, I've got five. They have to hear, see, or feel something that they haven't felt before. And it needs to be audible that they hit a shot and go, wow. Yeah. Or, okay, that feels really different. So, <clears throat> or that I'm, looks different. Look, oh. So I'm trying to play this game in my head that I say, okay, if I can do this in, I mean, I try and do it in two or three and just say, okay, just do this and see if it's different and then i can show them on video that it's because to me that's really important yeah right i think most golfers learn visually so i try and say okay this is where you were when we started and now we're three swings later and this is your impact position now yeah because that, that helps it, it and backs so up what you've said to them and then rick what that allows me to do is if i can get the player to go okay that feels really different that's more solid okay now i'm taking a divot then it buys me time, but it also, the student exhales. They go, okay, I'm not dying. I'm not drowning. Because that, so going back you've to your question. You've chucked them a life, uh, a life. I was never what any good. What do they call them over it? They call them like lifesavers, yeah, don't they? I was never any good at golf. So to this day, golf is difficult for me. I never come from golf instruction from the opinion or the, the headspace that, come on, man, just hit the draw. Because it's not easy. It's hard for me. So I think one of the reasons why I've been successful is I wasn't any good at golf. So I don't have an ego when it comes to equipment, when it comes to strategy. When it, I will do anything that I can do to try and hit the golf ball better. So I'll say to a student, listen, if we try this, I promise you, you will start to hit the golf ball better. Yeah. Right? If you'll just stick with this. And I do a lot of what my dad does. We basically just try and figure out, my dad has always said, listen, what is the cancer of the golf swing? Yeah. What is the one thing that this player is doing that is causing all the others? And that was the other thing growing up. My dad used to say to me, listen, fix one thing that changes all the others. You've got to make the call as you look at this player and he's like, you've got to see it fast. You've got to say, okay, what can I change right now that is going to fix all of the other things that I want to fix? Because I think that's where a lot of players get confused and yep. where I think a lot of instructors go wrong. You know from your instruction background, there's five or six things you want to change. But yep. if you try and change all of them individually at the same time... It's too complicated. 
the student, the player just checks out. They're like, mate, I, I can't, I can't do all of this stuff. Yeah. So I tried to think, you know, my dad's theory of the cancer. So I just started coming up with this theory that I had in my head is, you know, to me, the golf swing is a game. It's a, it's a set of dominoes, but there is one domino that a player is doing that causes the third, fourth, fifth domino, they're going to crash. And, you're, and that's why the player hits a shot and they're like, man, I'm not trying to do that. Yeah, of course. I'm trying to do the opposite. <laughs> but they tend to do one major thing in the golf swing and the dominoes just start going. So I started thinking into my head, it's like, okay, what if I can reverse the dominoes? So if I can change the one thing this player is doing that's causing all of the others, then they start to fall in, the, in place in the same way that you don't have to work on them. Yeah. The player then just all of a sudden, hey, now that the backswing's better, the downswing's in a better position, the input, but you're not thinking of any of those. We're just changing what the backswing is doing or what your posture is doing. So I'm just in my head trying to play this constant game of, can I reverse these dominoes and get the dominoes going in a positive direction in the same way as right now they're going in a negative direction. But I think be because I never played golf and aren't any good at golf, I cheerlead more. I care more Yeah, because I don't ever think that it's easy. You can almost relate to him. More. 100%. I mean, and that's, why I still give golf lessons to normal, regular people. I mean, it would be very easy at this point in my career to just say, listen, I don't work with anybody that isn't a scratch golfer. Yeah. Right. If you want to come take a golf lesson from me, you have to have single digit handicap scratch golfer. That's it. There are golf instructors that do that, that work with players on tour. I mean, Sean Foley, Foles doesn't really work with a lot of 25 handicappers. I can't right? imagine. Right. Foles works with great players. This is Sean Foley, by right. the way, for people listening and watching. So he doesn't, give ladies clinics to beginning golfers right and he's earned that right right he's he's earned that yeah but i still when i'm not on the road on tour yesterday i had a golf lesson with a member here who's in his mid-70s who doesn't have a lot of flexibility doesn't have, and i like working with those players because it's like it's an even bigger puzzle right yep. because the majority of the stuff that i want him to do in the golf swing that will help him. A lot of it physically he can't do. Yeah. A lot of it technically he doesn't have the skill set to do that. So it forces me as the instructor to say, okay, I'm dealing with not a great body, not a lot of natural God-given talent, speed, all of the things that you're, I'm lucky enough to work with on tour, right? I've got Formula yeah, One race cars, of course, yeah. right? The, cor the cars are fast, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, Mercedes, McLaren, Red Bull. Those are the, those are the cars, the type of uh, cars they're, that they're, I, they're your DJ, your Brooks. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to work with those. So the cars are pretty good. Yeah. So you can get in them and maybe not even be the best driver and get those type of cars around. The average golfer doesn't have a great car. No. So my job is to say okay with the limitations that you've got and the skill set that you've got I still have to help you improve and I that's where I go back to the bad golfer that I still am I always go from it saying okay I have to fix this person they can't walk out of here n not hitting it better no they they have to get better with a bad grip with bad flexibility with bad glutes and all of the tpi stuff <laughs> yeah yeah all this that goes okay. out the window they've got all these things that are against them yeah i have to fundamentally help this player improve so i'm guessing so let's say listener watcher has the opportunity of having a lesson with you which i'm sure is very hard to come by if you've got money, you can come take a golf. <laughs> well, you've got, if you've got cash, you can come take a golf lesson. Go on then. How much is a golf lesson? Um, for the members here at Floridian, I am three hundred dollars an hour. Three thousand. Three hundred dollars. That's more reasonable than I expected. I was expecting a few more decimal points. Non, a few more zeros in there. Non-members that aren't members here, I think I'm seven hundred for ninety minutes. I took all my lessons to ninety minutes rather than an hour because I think it gives me an opportunity oh, yeah. 
it gives me more scope to yeah. work on of course work on more things but also work on specific things longer who who is the most expensive coach in the world i think for a long time is mitchell spearman good old mitchell was like you know he was like five ten thousand dollars an hour what yeah mitchell spearman oh that's crazy i'm, I'm sure there was a there was a time when hank caney was super expensive yeah. as well wasn't there i guess like say they, they've earned the, the pedigree as you as you have i think you should, i think you should up your price <laughs> i think you're too cheap claude <laughs> I actually i actually should um, <laughs> um the, the other thing I, I wanted to kind of dive into you've mentioned a couple of times that you, you're not a particularly good golfer what does that what is that what have you got handicap oh god no i mean i play golf so rarely um i'm playing golf we have a, a tournament here over the weekend the floridian pro member it's every december and i'm playing this year i haven't played a round of golf probably in over a year um, Did, so now, now part of it is but you must be you single figures no hell no I'm a I mean at a push I'm a I'm a 8 or a 10 that's the single figures yeah I don't know about that it's not very good you my go body is bad I had back surgery in I had a microdisectomy in 2011 yeah um, I have I was the poster child that when TPI was just starting out, I'd, I'd go to all, I'm on the advisory board, I'd go to all the seminars and they were going through all their movement screens, you know, internal hip rotation. And I'd get up and they'd do the internal hip rotation screen on me and everybody thought it was a joke. And so Greg and Dave, you know, used to have to go, guys, he's, he's not kidding. His hips only, he in, only internally rotates two degrees on his left hip. So you're, not the, right hip. you're not the best dancer. So my body was bad and... I couldn't physically get my body to do a lot of the things. I have all of this information in my head, yeah, but I can't get my body to do any of it. So I'm working with a body that isn't great. So I can't practice a lot because it hurts my back. But what I've done is when I do try and play, um, I've tried to make it as easy as possible. I mean, I don't carry a five iron anymore. Yeah, I've gone to all hybrids and you know, in the longer irons. I've gone to a ton of loft. I've gone to, you know, I'm a one length guy. Um, I use, you know, one length heads. I mean, you know, they might as well be called Cobra shovels because they're so big. <laughs> so, um, I'm trying to do as many things as I can to make golf easier for me. Um, I When I do go out and play, you know, I'll go play on the white tees yeah. because I just don't have the speed. You know, if I get really, really good, you know, if I really catch one, I can carry it 270, 280 in the air. But if I could carry it 250, 260 on a regular basis, that's a win for me. Yeah. But, you know, it, that it, is not good, great golf. Do you need, here's a question for you. Do you think you need to be, and I think you've already just answered it then, a good golfer, a competent golfer to be able to coach? Because I, this is why I ask this question. Because sometimes if I've had, I do a break break seventy five series, okay, and let's say I go out and chop it, I shoot in the eighties, I've had a bad day and whatever. The amount of comments that come in and go, oh, I'm not going to listen to you now. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to listen to your instruction videos. You're like, yeah, but what I'm what I know about the golf swing is different to maybe how I've applied it to myself on the golf course that day. I think it's very hard to apply it to yourself all the time, you know. And like you say, your bodies are different. You don't practice as much. Listen, because if that was the case, who would be teaching the best players in the world? Elite golfers. The best players in the world are not great instructors. They're not. No. Right? I remember we were doing a golf school in Vegas in like the height of the Tiger Mania. We're talking like 2000. And he was in town. And we've got these eight people at a golf school at my dad's place in Vegas. And we're doing long bunker. Right? Doing fairway bunker. So we've got all these people sat right after lunch. And we're going to tell them how to get hit out of the long bunker. And Tiger had come to lunch with us. So now I said to Tiger, I said, yo... Will you get in and give the long bunker lesson, Dave? He's like, yeah, absolutely. So now Tiger Woods is going to get in and give eight average golfers how to get out of a fairway bunker. Yeah. Right? And so he gets in there and he talks about all the things that he does to, to hit a fairway bunker and everything like that. And, you know, everybody's taking notes and they're laughing and stuff like that. And he kind of is walking away and he's, he's laughing. And I was like, what are you laughing at? He's like, no, you don't want to know. I was like, no, no. come on. You, you know, we're all here. You can't. What are you laughing at? And he was like. I don't do any of that. <laughs> and I was like, get the <laughs> out of here. I was like, you don't do any of that. And he goes, 
no, I don't do any of that. And he, and I was like, so why did you tell the, he's like, well, I know what it, how to get out of a long bunker, but the way that I think about it, he's like, they'd never figure it out. I was like, okay, you can't leave us hanging now. Go through what you think about to hit a long bunker shot. Yeah. And halfway through, I said, shut the f up because these people will never recover. <laughs> I said, get out of here. And he's like, I told you, you didn't want to hear it. What he was, the way his brain was it, operating, it, it could never do that. So yeah, I mean, listen. But then again, when I, should, I can't imagine, and I've seen it in the past when, when people have asked Dustin Johnson, how do you hit a fade? And he, I don't know, I just, yeah, Freddie aim, Couples. It, aim it down the left and think fade, fade it back in. I think there's a big difference. It's like difference. They, don't, they don't think that they technically. Listen, for everybody listening, there is a big difference between playing golf and teaching and coaching golf. I think it's and a skill to coach. It's a communication. Listen, I, it's I've a, been doing it's this a guidance. For, I've been doing this for over 20 years, mm -hmm. right? I've, at this point, I have a PhD in golf instruction, Yeah. right? I mean, that's how long I've been doing it, right? And so... This thing that everybody says, well, if you weren't a great golfer, then why would I come take a golf lesson? If you look at it, I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson did not have a stellar football career. He was not one of the world's greatest footballers. No. Nope. Right? His career at Glasgow Rangers was, he was not the leading goal scorer. Nope. Right? He was not the player of the year. He is arguably the greatest football manager of all time. Correct. Yes. Now you have guys like Pep Gord. Pep was an amazing footballer, right? Yeah. He's a great footballer. He's a great, great manager. Like one of the best, right? But there have been great managers, you know, in every division, every league in Europe that weren't necessarily great players. Exactly. You know, Luis Enrique just got fired by the Spanish Federation for losing the World Cup. He's a hell of a footballer. Yeah. Right? But he gets fired as a manager because the team doesn't do well. Doesn't mean that he wasn't a great footballer. Exactly. But, but being, that, being a great player doesn't necessarily translate into, I think, great instruction. Because most great players are going to tell you to do what they do. Right? And they're going to tell you to do what they do based off of how they do it. Yeah. Most great players don't have the, the brain instruction-wise. First of all, they, don't have, they have no patience. Tour players have zero patience. A tour player who has played golf that has won a major championship is not going to sit on a driving range in, you know, outside of Liverpool on a Tuesday night in February where it's, you know, <laughs> Rory McIlroy isn't going to go there and give eight hours worth of golf lessons and do the 30-minute do the ones as well. So he's going to do eight He might not do that now. I, think, I don't think you he needs I mean? to. So the mental capacity and the mental fortitude that you have to have for all the instructors that are listening, that's not an easy job. No. And it's not an easy job to keep trying to keep your lessons fresh, trying to keep your delivery. I feel a lot of times as if I'm a stand-up comedian. And what I, I'm a, I'm a stand-up comedian. And the tour events that I go to, yeah, they're the romantic comedies. They're the big budget movies that I do, right? And it's cool. And it's a bunch of stuff. But at the end of the day, if you're a, if you're a comedian and you're lucky enough to be a movie star, you're also doing stand-up. Yeah. You know, Jerry Seinfeld, who's a, one of the great American comedians, Seinfeld, one of the greatest television shows of all time, Jerry is on tour 30, 40 weeks a year doing stand-up comedy. He's a comedian. Yeah. And so I look a lot of what I do for regular golfers. It's, it's stand-up comedy. I'm, I'm working on my act. I'm taking a player that, you know, you'll see something from a 20 handicapper that you will never see on tour. You will see somebody with a grip, with a posture, with a ball position, with a backswing. You will see a player do something that you'll go, you would never see that in no, the competitive not, world. Not a chance. It well, it obviously wouldn't have worked. Well, it wouldn't have worked. But you then have to say, okay, this is what you're presented with. Yeah. And you can't go, okay, hey, I work with Dustin Johnson, so I don't have to fix this because I don't have a lot. You don't have a lot of ability. You, you're not the most talented. Your body isn't great. So I'm just going to check out on this lesson now because I work with Dustin Johnson and I'll pass you on to somebody else. 
I have to find a way to work with that person. And I have to find a fix. And I bet you enjoy it. I do. I love it because you know, there's always that moment. We talked about this when I had you on my podcast. There is that aha moment that when a player hits a shot, hits a draw for the first time as a slicer or takes a divot oh, with a seven iron. So good. Right? Or makes good content or gets out of a bunker Correct. for the first time it's and best. hits that high soft spinner that the player, you can see how much that means to the player. But that means something to me. And I always tell the guys that work, you know, at my academy in Dubai or guys that I work with or when I do seminars, um, if your player's success, whether they're a 15 handicap or they're the number one player in the world, if you're working with them and, you know, it's easy to live and die. You know, my wife and I, we've been together now 11 years. She wasn't, you know, from a golf background. When we first started working together, and I remember Ernie Ells in 2012 had a chance. Ernie hadn't won in a long time. He had a chance to win Tampa, you know, and he, he bogeys, you know, a couple holes coming in. And I'm breaking and throwing stuff in the house and I'm screaming and she's looking at me. She's like, what the hell is wrong with you? She's like, you're acting like a, like a child. I was like, this is real life. This is sports. There's a winner and there's a loser. And were you coaching him at the time? Yeah, I was coaching Ernie. And, and so, I bet you was like, don't forget the commission I'm going to make if he so wins. She's like, what the hell is wrong with you? I was like, we're in a cut of his winnings. Dude, it's not the cut. It wasn't a cut of his winnings. It was the fact that he had a chance to win a golf tournament, yeah. didn't, and it's it's beating me up. So I say to people all the time: you give a 15 handicap or a golf lesson, and they don't hit it solid, and they walk out. And if you're not driving home being affected by that, get a new fucking job. Yes. Find something else to do. Yeah. Because it it should mean something to you. As a golf coach, you 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 want to help people. Yeah. You want to help people get better. And I think, and again, I must admit, I, I, we were here yesterday and, and you and your dad were having having dinner and I came over and had a chat. And what your dad said to me, honestly, I drove home last night with like a smirk on my face because he, he said he's watched some of the videos. He likes the way I deliver my content. It's simple. Yeah. And that's how I do like to deliver the content. I want it to be simple. I want people to be able to understand what I say because I think there are, I think golf coaching, certainly since the introduction of, of launch monitors and technology, I think there's too many golf scientists now we are cre- we have created a, a couple of generations now in my opinion of data collectors it feels like they're golf instructors all, they just take data the, it's all about the big words yeah. it's all about the confusion data okay this is what you're doing on this is what the launch track man this is what the track man says great yeah now what yeah right and here's these big words and all of this stuff and you know my but that's not coaching is it no that's not coaching is understanding the person in front of you how you can get your message across and again you hear all these stories of Sir Alex Ferguson how he managed people. different players yeah, he to. was the best people manager yeah. and you can't you can't treat all your players the same I think my dad is as close to as to Sir Alex as you could get right because my dad is a he is a manager of people yeah. he has this innate ability you know he's just started working with Ricky Fowler again after you know a couple of year absence and immediately, Ricky started to play better. Now, part of that, I think, is you know my dad's ability to diagnose the process. But I also think that my dad has this ability, and all great coaches have this ability to say, come with me on this journey. Yeah. I, I won't, I will not let you down. It's an arm around the shoulder. I will, we will fix the problem. Yeah. It's a, I've got you. I, I've got you. I, I had that experience earlier this year. We were going out to San Diego, first tournament of the year, and I've been working with Pat Perez for a couple of years, and I hadn't seen Pat since the end of the FedEx. He played, he was playing in Palm Springs while we were on there, and he was like, bro, this is so bad. I'm, I, I don't even think I'm going to play Torrey Pines. I'm hitting it sideways. I was like, I haven't seen you in two months. And I, and I, and that was, you know, he was trying to come out here. I was trying to, our schedules didn't match up. And he was like, man, I'm hitting it so bad. He's like, I'm a shoot, Torrey Pines. He's like, and I'm shooting a million in Palm Springs, right? Where the, there's no wind, there's no rough. The course is, you know, 90 unders winning, right? Yeah. You shoot four under in, in Palm Springs and you're, you know, the first day and you're almost in last place. Because yeah. somebody's going to shoot 61, 62, right? Yeah. So I, I was flying out. I was, I flew out with DJ and, and we were on the plane and I was messaging back and forth. And he's like, I think I'm going to pull out. And I said to him, I promise you, we will fix this. I said, I promise you. Yeah. I said, so 
let's get to work. I said, as soon as we land, I'll meet you straight at the golf course and everything. And he finished seventh that week and had a legit chance on Sunday to win. Wow. But that was, again, that is, is that coaching and is that instruction? It's, it's a big combination of both. It's, yeah, we did some big things technically that week, but it was also me saying to him, we will fix this. Yep. We are on the right track and you have to buy in. You have to buy into what we're working on. And we're not going to throw it out on Wednesday. We're going to gut this thing out. We're going to stick with this. Yeah. You know, I told Pat this year. Is that reassurance the, for them? I told him at the last live event, you know, he was really, he'd, he'd been struggling. He didn't play good in Saudi Arabia. And I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do this week. Okay. But you need to be on board with what we're going to do. But I said, I, and I said this to his, in front of his caddy, but I said, I'm telling you this now. If you throw this out Thursday or Friday and say, I'm going to try something out, I said, I'm done working with you. Wow. I said, I yep. said because you're too quick to throw things out when you have a bad round or you hit a bad shot. And one of the things I think that you know, can sometimes hurt players is they're so hard on themselves, their expectations are so high. So I said, we're on the right track. But I said, if you don't play four round, all three rounds all week with this, you find someone else to coach you in 2023 because I'm out. Because I can't do my job. No. Right? If you won't let me do my job, if you won't buy into what we're working on. And so I think that's, you know, and again, that's another thing that I learned from my dad is you have to exude as an instructor. You have to make the, the student believe in what you're doing. Yeah. They have to think that you can fix the problem. And you almost have to put some, some accountability back on them. Absolutely. Like they've got to work hard for this. If we're going to change it, it's not just one Listen, side. for everyone that's listening that wants to get better at, at, and improve their hand, you know, there's a great, one of my, one of my favorite people to follow um, is a guy named Nick Saban. Um, Nick is the head football coach at the University of Alabama, so college football in America. And he is, he's the Sir Alex Ferguson. He's a giant, right? Yeah bunch of national championships and I just I'm not a huge American football guy but I am a massive fan of coaching yeah. and I watch the way Nick Saban coaches and he has this great quote he's at the he's at a press conference and he and it, and you can go online and if and search on on YouTube it's called the illusion of choice and Nick says you know all these kids today think that they have all of these choices and he said but to be great you don't really have a lot of choices because to be great it takes what it takes yeah. to be great and to get better at anything. The math is the math. The work is the work. So for everyone listening, if you are going to try and get better at, at, at your golf, taking golf lessons is hugely, hugely important. But then it's hugely important that you as the student then goes and implements what you're trying to work on. And if you're going to go take a golf lesson and you're going to work with someone and, and, one, I also think that there's a lot of things that people listening, you as the student, it's your job to do your homework. Mm -hmm. It's your job to figure out what you want to work on, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what changes you want to make. You have to make that honest. You mentioned that about tracking you know, performance out on the golf course. You mentioned not enough golfers do that. I don't think the average golfer is more worried about their doing what they're doing on the driving range than what they're doing on the golf course. Yeah. And to me, part of, you know, what we talked about earlier, playing golf, understanding, okay, I went out and I played nine holes today. Okay, what do I need to go work on on the driving range? So for everyone listening, and let's say, make it as simple as we can. I know there's technology out there that, that players could use. How, how could they f keep cat stats? And what should they be keeping stats of? I mean, I think if you're trying to improve your handicap, one of the things that I always try to say to players is at the end of every round, write down how many three putts you had. Okay. And then write, how, write down how many double and triple and quadruple bogeys you have. Yeah. Right? Okay. Turn the, turn the three putts into two putts. Okay? So if you can eliminate, or let's say you have three or four three putts. Right? Take two of those and turn them into two putts. Yeah. Okay? So that's two shots. Then take the double bogey you made and make, turn it into a bogey. That's three shots. Now take the, the triple bogey you made and turn it into a double. Right? So the average golfer that's listening to this, 
in coming up at the end of 2022 and 2023, if everybody listening to this podcast made more bogeys in 2023, their handicaps would improve. Not more birdies, not more eagles, just made more bogeys. Instead of doubles and triples. As opposed to the doubles and the triples. Yeah. Just make more bogeys, make more pars. Would you you all- don't have to make two, three, four birdies around to improve your handicap. What you need to stop doing is making eights and sevens and nines and sixes. Would you, Would you? let's say you, you got a golfer writing all the three puts down and all the doubles, would you then also go through those three puts and go, okay, what was there a pattern? Yeah. Is it speed control? Is it green reading? Is it technique? Was I too far away maybe from the hole? Yeah. You know, did I, did I miss all of my second puts because they were left to right yep. or because they were downhills? And then you could start to really diagnose and go, well, actually... I could see a pattern. Yeah. Three of those four, three of those three puts, they're all left to right puts. Yeah. Well, guess what? Let's go and practice my left yeah. to right puts. Or we've put you in, we've got a, a putter studio here. We've got Sam, we've got force plates, we've got six cameras. We can look at all of it, right? And so what I always try and do is say to a player, okay, let's go and take a look at, we'll put you on Sam, look at what your data is. We'll go ahead and see how you're moving, your weight and everything like that. We'll video your stroke. We'll video what the ball is doing. We'll video all of that, right? And then we'll go out on the putting green. So we'll take all the data and then we'll go putt. Yeah. There are loads of times someone's data is horrendous. My dad is a very good putter, right? He's a really, really good putter. Has been pretty much his whole life. And back in the day when he and Tiger were working together, every Wednesday night of a major, they'd have a putting contest right. late in the afternoon. And I watched my dad smoke Tiger as much as Tiger beat him wow. with the worst stroke you've ever seen, right? <laughs> so all of the data... But you could get it in the hole. But all of the data tells us that he's a bad putter, right? But you take him out on the putting green and he's a good putter. Yeah. And I asked him, what, what do you think about when, when you're putting? And he's like, I don't understand the question. And I said... What do you think about it? He goes, making it. What are you thinking about? I'm like, yeah, no, I know that. He goes, no, no, no. He's like, there are two outcomes when you putt. That's it. The ball's either going to go in or it's not. From one feet or 50 feet. There are only two outcomes (laughs) when you putt. Yeah, that's true. So for 20 footer, you're either going to make it or you're not. And so in his brain, he's like, I don't spend any time thinking about not making it. I just think about making it. Wow. Well, it's interesting. I think there's three options, certainly around here. There's making it, there's not making it. And then putting it off the green. There's missing the green, <laughs> which I did, which I actually did yesterday. Um, it's a fascinating, unbelievable story. What what I think now, before why would the, as the sun starts to come down, we were talking about you giving me a little cheeky golf lesson. Let's go. Um, my, so, so, before we go down and, and actually, so talk me through your golf game. So first of all. How long have we got? Now, but so, okay, so let's talk. What I would do is, so this is what I do when I give golf. So yeah. talk me through your body. What what are we dealing with body-wise? What injuries have we had? What is the body makeup? I know from previous experiences, I don't particularly have any injuries. I know my right ankle is weak. Okay. And I know that my, my right hip doesn't seem to want to rotate. And I feel like it's all down to the right foot so i end up i end up staying really flat footed on my right foot okay. i can't roll it so okay. when, when i come to hit i can't roll onto okay. the inside of my right foot right and as a result then i get quite flat footed from a technical standpoint okay. when you in, play your best which shape do you hit do you hit draws do you hit fades? when i play my best i um my natural shot shape is a draw okay okay when I play my best, I'm thinking of hitting a fade. Okay. And it still might draw, but I'm but basically I'm just trying to neutralize it out as much as I can. And the bad shot on the golf course historically goes where? Left. Starts left, goes left, starts, starts right. On, t- on target, goes left. Right. And divot pattern more on the golf course, more shots that are thin or more shots that are heavy? Thin. Okay. One thing I wanted to potentially... My short game's terrible terrible as well but that's a, that's a totally different story and my putting's absolutely woeful but anyway we've got all that my, my strength is my driving okay because i feel like i can tee it up i can hit up on it I, if i which, swing left which with the foot the fact that 
you don't have a lot of this, then you can kind of stay back on the right foot and I launch do. it and hit, I hit up I on hit it. Super up on the ball. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, and then if I'm if I want to try and get it in control, I feel like I aim my body left and hit more down. I don't hit down. I just no, hit of course less, not. I hit less up. Yeah. Uh, with my irons, I think that comes into play as well. I'll get away with it with my irons because again, you can kind of catch it clean and get away with it. I prefer being in the rough than I do on the fairway. Okay, that makes sense. I hate it when I'm at a beautiful golf course like this, and I hate hitting on driving ranges like this because the turf is just too pristine, <laughs> and I, I, my divot pattern isn't consistent enough at all. Right. So I'll hit a couple of pitches. So and would you get my would you say that if someone could fix for you, if we could fix the direction, or we could fix the contact, which would you prefer? Contact. Yeah, and 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 again, that's to me a constant running theme in the way that I instruct. I think the everybody listening to this podcast is obsessed with the direction the golf ball is going, right? And they're not as concerned and they're not as diligent and they're not as, you know, trying to fix the contact. They're trying to fix the direction. Tour players have directional misses. They don't have contact misses. No. So people ask me all the time, what separates great ball strikers tour players from everybody else. The single biggest thing that separates people that you're watching on TV is their misses. Okay, you'll see them every now and again hit, you know, a bad shot. Yep. You'll see a player maybe out of the rough shank one. You might see a player, if it's wet, maybe hit a little bit behind it. Maybe every now and again hit one thing. But Roy McIlroy's misses are directional. They yep. are not contact. Never. And I, Every I've, now and again, maybe with a longer club, maybe a driver, he'll hit. He'll get something a little bit off the toe. Yeah. But the contact, yeah. is always good. I, I've I've been lucky enough to play with quite a few tall players now. It's the one thing when I, we're on a par three and hitting shots, I, I can I always know, I already know what it's going to sound like. Yeah. I already know what the divot pattern's going to look like. Yep. I already know the the direction. I don't know. No. They might pull one a bit left. They might push one. Like I said, they're not perfect in that capacity. But strike-wise, after strike-wise... Well, if you're hitting balls at a range, any range in the UK, let's say you're hitting balls, it's Wednesday night, middle of winter, and everybody, you know, and it's just miserable, and everybody's hitting balls, right? And you're just hitting balls in your bay. And without you knowing it, right, John Rahm rocks up three stalls behind you. But you're not aware that he's there. Well, I've got a story about this. Right? And... You know, you're hitting balls and everything. It's funny you by say the, that. By the time he starts to get to about a seven iron, but by the time he gets to a five iron, you're going to turn around because you're going to hear something that you don't hear. Well, this, this you don't hear it me. yourself, and you don't hear it on the driving range. This happened to me. I was up at a couple of, quite a number of years ago, five or six years ago, maybe even longer, seven years ago it probably was now. I was at Trump International Golf Course in Aberdeen. And I was on the driving range, about to go and play, and I was hitting some balls and just kind of keeping myself to myself. And I, I'd kind of, I was aware another golfer had come behind me. There was literally two of us. And I was aware of another golfer behind me, and uh, they started hitting. I was like, "That sounds good." And then straight away, I st they started hitting mid middle irons. I was like, "Sheesh, that sounds really good." And I'm thinking, mine doesn't sound that good. But I was right at the end of the range. I'm thinking, how am I going to get an opportunity to turn? I turn around. It's Phil Mickelson, and I was like. Of course it's Phil Mickelson. Of course it is. Of course the sound like, is good. There's no way that... And everyone was just buttoned after buttoned after buttoned. It was the back of the ball. It was turf. It was... And like I say, every great golfer. So out of all the things... And I think, again, I'm not using this as an excuse. In the UK, we hit off mats a lot more, at driving range and things like that. It masks those kind of missed strikes. Every time I come to a range down here, I'm thinking, oh, God, I almost, I almost don't want to hit balls. I'd rather just go and play because it almost does my confidence least good. Or if I go to a fantastic Lynx golf course and the driving range is a bit sandy and whatever, oh, God, I can't stand it. But when I'm out on the golf course, I can manage it. But I feel like on the driving range. So, yeah, strike would be my, my number one thing. If we can work on that, I'd be over the moon. Let's go do it. Claude, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. But guys, make sure you check out Claude's podcast as well. Uh, Son of a Butch. There you go. Great name, by the way. It is a great name. Um, weekly episodes. And uh, again, thanks for having me down we've here. Had, if, we've had Rick on, you know. And I'm glad we could uh, return um, you being a guest on my podcast. Cr so Cross-pollination, they say that. There you the go. Podcast biz. There you go. He's now teaching me social media. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you very soon. Let's go and get a lesson from Claude Hartley.